Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Vijay Samuel, and uh, I do architecture for uh, the Reliability Engineering Group at uh, eBay. Hello, everyone. I'm Sandeep, and I am the lead engineer for the observability platform at eBay. Uh, we are here to uh, share our story about uh, distributed tracing, and uh, we have captioned it, uh, all the warning signs were out there. Uh, show of hands, uh, how many folks use uh, distributed tracing in production today? Uh, how, many about, how many folks have heard about it and really want to get started on the journey? Okay, uh, quite a few are already using it and a few starting off, that's interesting. Uh, so what is distributed tracing? Um, a, tra a, a trace is something that gives us the big picture of what happens when a request is made to an application. Whether your application is a monolith with a single database or a sophisticated mesh of services, traces are essential to understanding the full path a request takes in your application. So this is the by the book uh, definition for, uh, uh, for a trace. Uh, trace uh, is very, very useful in very complicated environments. Uh, and at eBay, um, a request to either view an item or search uh, for items, uh, check out, like all of these have uh, a lot of microservices and databases that uh, interact with each other before the user intent is uh, fulfilled. And uh, for such a use case, uh, distributed tracing is uh, very powerful when it comes to triaging uh, active issues. Um, our scale, uh, which is something that I like to talk about a lot, uh, uh, we have 14 days worth of retention of uh, traces. Uh, and uh, we ingest roughly 6.5 million spans per second, which translates to 561 billion spans per day, um, which we do with the 5,000 CPUs and uh, 250 uh, terabytes of uh, so solid state uh, drive storage. Uh, this may not look like a big number, uh, and uh, that is uh, intentional. Uh, if we compare it to our uh, logging volumes, which we do uh, up more than 15 or 20, uh, 15 to 20 petabytes of logs per day, uh, tracing is something that we have intentionally tried to keep the scale to, the, to a minimum, uh, but at the same time uh, maximize the utility that we are able to extract out of it. Uh, tracing, in, in our opinion, is a four-point problem, uh, and this is something that everyone needs to solve as they get into the journey of uh, distributed tracing. Um, the first one being, uh, there needs to be end-to-end -end, uh, in instrumentation. So by the definition, every single application needs to be instrumented with the, uh, distributed tracing. So this involves getting every developer to instrument, uh, ensure that uh, context propagation is being done right. So when the client invokes another service, the required headers need to be propagated to ensure that everyone in the call chain knows that they are part of the same uh, request chain. Uh, and uh, ensure that the instrumentation is judicious. Uh, uh, so we don't want to dump too many things because the longer the call chain gets, the more time it's gonna take for someone to make, uh, uh, make sense out of it. Uh, the next one is, okay, we have everything instrumented, now we need a platform. So. Uh, there are there are a few ways in which you can go about it. Uh, the classic build or buy, where you can either uh, pick a vendor, uh, pick an open source project, or you can build your own on top of a database. Uh, you optimize for cost. Uh, is, re is retaining everything worth it? Um, so you either go uh, for things like head sampling, tail sampling, where you retain only a sample and you retain only for a finite number of days where you feel that uh, uh, it needs to be retained this long for me to resolve, say, a P2 bug or a P3 bug or, or whatever. Uh, and finally, what are the use cases that you intend to solve? Uh, a product without uh, good use cases is uh, meaningless. So at least uh, in our case, uh, we are like, okay, we'll use it for triaging, uh, automated root cause analysis, and uh, performance tuning, uh, which we can talk about later on. So being the architect, I thought I was wise beyond my years. I have everything figured, off, figured out off the bat, and this is gonna be super straightforward, limited time, get it done, and then we have tracing. So that's how, that's how we started, and uh, Sandeep will do the next section. Yeah, let's uh, look at the first problem which we try to solve, which is the end-to-end -end instrumentation. Uh, we decided to go with uh, you know uh, open telemetry. That's like the obvious choice because that's the industry standard right now. And uh, pretty much 
uh, anybody is trying to instrument today is going to instrument in uh, open telemetry. And so we knew that you know we are going to get some free instrumentation when we get started with this. Uh, and we wanted to optimize for the mass adoption. We wanted to target up, you know, we wanted to do less work, but get as much as possible. 90% age use case is good enough. You know, we don't have to target the 100% age use case. That's what we aim for. Uh, make instrumentation op optional for the developers. If we try to work with every single developer and get them to do the instrumentation, that's not gonna happen. So we wanted to ship the free instrumentation as much as possible. Now let's look at each of these bullet points in details. Uh, Adopt open telemetry. Uh, so open telemetry is the industry standard and pretty much for any commonly used programming language, there is an uh, there is a SDK available from the open telemetry SDK, or from the open telemetry. The best part is it's it's actually support, supported by the open telemetry. It's not a community community supported. Uh, and uh, you know, there's a, after a lot of ev uh, evolution, the semantic conventions have been standardized for the open telemetry. And anybody instrumenting using the open telemetry, you know, they're following going, they're going to be following the semantic conventions. Uh, open telemetry also supports a, a collector, which has a plethora of capabilities. You know, it's more like a jigsaw puzzle, and you know, you can you can pick and choose whatever you're interested in. It, you know, there are literally hundreds of things we could do with the collector. Uh, and by hopping on the open telemetry bandwagon, you know, maybe we could get instrumentation capabilities and the learnings for free. The next, uh, optimize for the mass adoption. In eBay, we have something called managed framework, uh, especially for the Node.js and the Java. If you, uh, you know, any application built in, pretty much any application built in Java and Node.js uses the, uh, the managed framework. And 90% of what powers the eBay site is built using this managed framework. And we decided to ship the instrumentation through this managed framework. And uh, this managed framework runs a program called monthly site-wide upgrades. So it's mandatory. Every single application using the managed framework have to upgrade to the latest version of the framework every month. Uh, the best part of that is, you know, if we have any new instrumentation which we want to ship, uh, or if we want to fix any of the existing instrumentation, within the next 30 days, it will, it will have a turnaround. It will, be, it will be shipped and all the application will be live in production having that feature. Uh, and yeah, and, like, and as I mentioned, you know, we decided to ship the standard in instrumentation through uh, the managed framework. Uh, yeah, so the for everything else, I mean, this is this covers ninety percentage of the use case at eBay. What about the rest ten percentage? For the rest of the ten percent, we thought you know we can just go uh, at the infrastructure level. Example, pretty much all the network calls goes through the service mesh. Uh, if we enable the tracing at the service mesh, we are going to get some instrumentation for free for those 10% of, uh, of the applications. Uh, the next one, make instrumentation optional for the developers. If we have to chase every single developer, or if we have to work with every single developers within uh, the company, within the eBay, it's going to take forever to get the instrumentation. So what we decided was to, uh, you know, the, the managed framework, which I talked about, you know, for in the managed framework, we decided to ship the instrumentation. Example, even to make a client call, or if you're writing a server API, or if you have to make a database call, we basically automatically instrument. The spans will be automatically created for you. The context propagation will automatically happen for you. And this, uh, this happens even for the Android and iOS, iOS applications as well. There's a managed framework for both Android and iOS. And by not involving the developers, you know, we can definitely move a whole lot faster. If not, you know, I can't imagine, you know, going chasing all the 8,000, 10,000 applications we have in eBay and working with every single team to get the instrumentation done. Uh, the next problem is to build the platform. Now we figure out the instrumentation, we have to build the platform. Uh, the first thing is to uh, pick the fast storage technology. For that, we went with the ClickHouse. Uh, and uh, you know, scaling out, we went. Uh, we took a little bit different approach. We decided not to build a one single monster cluster. Instead, we decided to go with multiple clusters uh, of the ClickHouse. Uh, within eBay, we have something called uh, Ring. The Ring, what what it does is it. It does two level of sharding. The first level dis, uh, decides which cluster to write the trace to, and the second level of uh, second level of sharding decides which shard to write the data to, basically. Uh, and also, this makes it makes our life easier. We don't have to maintain a one single monster cluster. You know, there will be multiple. It's easy to scale it out. Basically, we'll have multiple ClickHouse clusters. And the last one is to implement an open standard. Uh, Agar is 
uh, is the widely used uh, standard for anyone who wants to consume the trace. Uh, we basically support the Agar APIs. We have implemented the the protocol protocol for spec of the Agar API, which the end users use. Uh, hand, oh yeah, so let's look at a typical cluster at eBay. Uh, so we have the managed Java applications and managed Node.js applications. They are built on the managed framework, which I just talked about. And we also have generic applications. Generic applications, like example, if you want to write a GoLang application or Python application, we, we call it as a generic application. And uh, we also have the open telemetry collector deployed in every single Kubernetes clusters. And all these applications ship, get shipped with the open telemetry uh, SDK. And uh, you know uh, whatever traces they emit gets written to the open telemetry collector in the within the cluster. A well-known endpoint is exposed, and all the traces will be written to the spans and traces will get written to the open telemetry collector within the cluster. And from the open telemetry collector, there is a gateway, the trace gateway, where the traces gets written, and eventually it goes to the trace store, which is ClickHouse in our use case. Similarly, there is also metrics which is written to open telemetry collector, which goes to the metric ingest and eventually to the metric store. Uh, for querying the data, we have some uh, Sherlock I.O. console uh, through which, you know, uh, there's also a query endpoint. The Sherlock I.O. console talks to the query, trace query, and similarly talks to the metrics query to query the metrics data. Sherlock I.O. is the brand name of the internal observability platform what we have at eBay. I'll hand over to eBay, uh, I'll hand over to Vijay, sorry, to talk about the, <laughs> <laughs> well, he represents eBay. Uh, so the next part is uh, optimizing for cost. Like I mentioned, like uh, we do have a multi-petabyte logging system, uh, which has a fair bit of cost. And we're tracing, and with the logging system, we learned that we don't need all the logs to be present. So we trace, uh, even when we ramped this instrumentation, we did a ramp in such a way that we started at 0.01%, uh, and then 0.1%, 1%, and then we kept going higher to the point where we saw Okay, beyond this point, it's going to be more redundant than, than useful. Uh, so optimizing for cost was a big deal for us when we started off. And uh, the, the foundational belief was that it's okay to send less. Uh, even after sending less, are there opportunities to eliminate re redundancies uh, further? Uh, and then how can we scale with the traffic? So similar to logs, uh, and unlike metrics, uh, tracing is very seasonal. So depending on how much more people are shopping on eBay uh, on various times of the day or days of the week uh, or holiday periods or whatnot, we should be able to scale with the traffic. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, with regards to sending less, we decided to do uh, head sampling at the client. Uh, so we typically only do 2% of all requests and we do parent-based uh, sampling. Uh, this greatly reduces the overhead on the application as well because uh, more uh, higher sampling on the client means that there is more overhead on the application itself. Um, and uh, eBay in itself has a lot of uh, transactions that are going on at any given time, regardless of purchase or just shopping around. Uh, so the high traffic of the applications uh, negates the need uh, for higher sampling percentage because uh, lower percent, you should see every kind of requests that are coming in. Uh, oops. Yeah. So uh, with regards to eliminating uh, redundancy further, uh, um, uh, as I mentioned, like not every spans are useful. Uh, so you have certain spans that might have very high latency that maybe violates an SLO, uh, or you have spans that have errors against them. Spans that uh, have particular attributes, for example, spans that are tagged against a very particular feature flag that you might be interested in. Um, so we sample, we try to sample all of that along with the uh, maybe retaining 1% of everything that was successful. Um, so with that, we basically do a tail sample where after two hours, uh, users are only uh, able to view the subset that we extracted out and only those we retain for uh, 14 days. And uh, the initial approach that uh, we used was just to use the open telemetry collector's uh, tail sampling processor. Um, for Auto scale, we use uh, KEDA. Uh, uh, as we see more traffic, uh, KEDA scales it out, um, and we are good to go. And with regards to usage, like this was the first time that anyone was able to see all um, all the applications in a in a single call chain. So we were like a waterfall de depicting every single hop that the request went through. Like there's nothing more than uh, this that people should need. So you, you just take it or leave it.
and then we li lived happily ever after. Like, uh, uh, and and the story ends here. Uh, I wish I could say that, but we we built all these things, and practically no one was using it. Um, and why was this? So, what everyone faced, we faced too. So we were no different. Like we we tried to be ahead of the game, but. Um, problems like uh, context propagation. So regardless of there being a managed framework, what ended up happening is that uh, people did not use the framework for certain things like, oh, I want a specialized HTTP client. They used that and they did not propagate context. So the call chain breaks. Um, there are applications that have a mix of high traffic APIs and low traffic APIs. And when you do 2% across all of them, it's gonna mask the the low traffic APIs to the point where there are no traces at all for those for those APIs. The collector is hard. The collector is uh, uh, the Lego analogy plays in, where it's like you can either build something really good or really, really ugly that costs a lot. And tail sampling. Uh, tail sampling um, in memory, like how the collector does today, without globally routing everything to a single collector, is, is near impossible. And it's very hard to determine if it's going to take five minutes for a trace to end or five seconds for it to end, you cannot keep storing everything in memory. It's going to cost too much. Um, and it, 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 it went against uh, some of the design philosophies that we had. And uh, this, is the, this is the one that's really hard. Like, for whatever reason, there was a small glitch and you lost a single span out of, out of uh, 200, 300 spans. It's, there's a good chance that you're going to run into a wild goose chase that actually was just losing the span. And uh, uh, this is the one that kills me the most. Like We are at the mercy of uh, developers and uh, uh, SREs, um, and them not using it for whatever reason, bugs, or is it something new? Uh, if they're not using it, then, then uh, it's difficult to get adoption. So we went back to the drawing board, and uh, we realized that some problems are unavoidable. So we had to work with developers. Like, uh, so we started going to each and every uh, application, find, found out like what are the breakages that were there uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the way that they're instrumenting. And we came up with some uh, nifty utilities that allows them to wrap their thread pools with uh, something that can pass uh, proper propagate context and whatnot. Uh, and then we started doing some learning sessions through SREs where they convey the importance of traces, convey the importance of using the right libraries for context propagation and whatnot. And over time, we have started fixing the instrumentation gaps that are there. Uh, we did a huge round of performance tuning, uh, which we talked about in uh, KubeCon uh, Paris, where we, we sliced and diced every portion of the open telemetry collector, looked at how well it performs, and came up with the correct uh, piecing of the Legos. Um, and this is an ongoing effort. Sometimes we have to do it again, depending on how the collector evolves. But this is something that we need to keep doing. So, uh, rinse and repeat until there are zero drops on the trace pipeline. And then for things that were not solvable for, through either the SDKs or uh, the, the collector, we created a new path where, uh, with regards to the architecture itself, uh, we try to keep things simple. Uh, I'm a big believer that if uh, you're trying to complicate things, then you're not doing it the right way. Um, so what we ended up doing is uh, we have a per, per cluster installation of open telemetry collectors where you generate red metrics uh, within the cluster itself and we write directly to storage uh, through our gateway, no, no, no message bus, nothing, where we try to pick one shard per trace ID and write all the trace IDs into the single, uh, single shard. And we basically convinced everyone around saying that, okay, 100% sampling is never going to happen. It's, it's, uh, cost prohibitive, people are not going to use it, uh, and the lower the sampling, the lower the complexity requirements, which means that you're not going to complicate the architecture. Um, for adaptive tracing, uh, for, for, uh, for low traffic APIs, uh, we are actively working on moving to uh, uh, the Jaeger remote sampling, where through our metrics on uh, how the APIs are being consumed on a daily basis, any API that has less than, say, 15,000 calls per day, we, we treat it as a low traffic API, and we push uh, a Jaeger sa sampling policy where we say that this service name and this operation name needs to get 100% uh, uh, sampling. So that way, um, regardless of uh, the, the global sampling being 2%, uh, all the low traffic APIs 
with negligible cost increase, you get uh, full visibility into uh, what is happening. And if we are being adaptive about it, we can also do things like, okay, when a rollout is happening, increase the sampling for the given pool or application uh, so that you have uh, better visibility. Uh, this is a very important one, like uh, true tail sampling happens in storage. Uh, we completely ditch the tail sampler on uh, open telemetry collector, and we rely on exemplars to tell us what is the, uh, what is what is worth sampling and what is, what is not. Uh, and to avoid uh, sampling too aggressively, we kick off sampling only after 10 or 15 minutes so that any long, long tail uh, traces are able to complete before we do the, uh, do the tail sampling. So the way that this looks, um, Jurassi and I have been trying hard to come up with a good name, unsuccessful, but like uh, hopefully he has a name for it soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he's saying Vijay sampling, uh, but yeah. So uh, what what we are uh, what we are doing is that uh, open telemetry collectors write to our ingest. It writes to a raw trace table. Uh, same way the metrics collectors write to our metric ingest, our aggregators, and then to metric store. But we have a uh, so and and the other thing is that there is the span metric connector which writes the red, uh, span metrics for every span into our metrics pipeline. So the metrics pipeline, what it's going to do is it's going to take all the exemplars and write it to what we call a tail sampler ingest. And these exemplars are persisted on uh, ClickHouse in a table called uh, sample trace ID table. And then uh, we have a tail sampler job that will just look at all the uh, trace IDs and then do a select star and then copy from the raw trace table to the sample trace table whenever the trace ID is being reported into the sample table. So this is very powerful in the sense that every uh, application has a Prometheus endpoint. It has uh, histograms that are being uh, uh, instrumented, and you are conveying uh, exemplars for every histogram bucket that's there, for every host, for every application, for every error scenario that's there. And we are harvesting all those trace IDs, and then we are basically using them to do our sampling decision. And this greatly improves our ability to have a representative sample of the entire kind of uh, latency profiles that are being seen without having to incur the cost. And finally, one major pivot that we have been doing is that we know that tracing has always been meant for machines. So whether it be automated triage, you can generate a critical path. Uh, there is a famous paper from uh, Uber that describes how to construct a critical path, um, use that and evaluate the health of every application in the critical path. You can do impact scope analysis. Okay, an application is failing, find out what are the other applications that are uh, involved. The same call chain is used there. And if there is an SLO violation, especially for latency-based SLO violations, uh, call chains are very important. You, you, are, uh, you cannot find uh, the, the bottleneck without knowing the entire call, call flow. So there are more problems to solve. Uh, so one of the things that uh, uh, we are uh, still deeply in thought about is how can we do aggregate trace analysis? End of the day, you cannot handpick a few traces and make a decision out of it. Sometimes you need uh, to look at everything uh, together. So, and, and one of the reasons being that the number of call chains for a given application are not necessarily finite, especially with things like feature flags and whatnot. The call chains can, can be very arbitrary depending on what the feature flag actually tries to do. And uh, span metrics connector and the service graph connector, they are not sufficient. So we are looking at how can we do some storage-based analysis given that we store the entire trace in a single shard. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, as I mentioned during the panel, like end-to-end -end observability is very important to us, starting from uh, mobile all the way to uh, uh, mobile or browser all the way to the last database call that was uh, done. How can, how can uh, we... Uh, uh, understand what's going on, how can we understand user journeys across various pages on the site, and how can we look at uh, long-running sessions. Um, so was it all worth it? Anyone? Yes, no? Yes, yeah. So like, uh, it's been challenging to say the least. Uh, there are a few places where we, had, we have had to be uh, creative, but definitely the ability to look at the entire ecosystem from start through finish and make uh, automated decisions on top of it, um, I think uh, it's definitely worth the effort that we have uh, gone through. Uh, with that being said, uh, um, if there's time for questions, like. Here we go. Uh, hey. 
so just uh, double clicking on the trace sampling strategy you implemented hmm. uh, was it because the tail based sampling take is too much memory if you want to do that through hotel collector or or was there some other reason for there that there are multiple reasons um, what what we saw was uh, different applications have different latency profiles so we have uh, applications that take 2 seconds to serve an api so those is fairly easy uh, to do tail based sampling but if you are modeling uh, kubernetes pod life cycle as a trace for example can take minutes uh, how do you generically fit a time frame for which the uh, memory needs to be uh, flushed to do the decision the other one is uh, request can go through multiple clusters uh, kubernetes clusters uh, request isn't contained to a single cluster and we mindfully said that we are not going to try to bring spans from across multiple clusters into tail samplers and then make decisions in memory so from a complexity perspective and from uh, uh, memory perspective it did, it did not meet our requirement we lose nothing so there also it's a policy here also it's an assumed policy basically okay sounds good Thank you so much. I think we just ran out of time. So, but we invite, um, you know, for anybody who has questions to approach the speakers. Okay. So I thank, can, yeah, thank I you can so much. Take questions offline. Thank you so much.